Okay, we are recording. Great. Well, Hello. good morning, Caitlin. Hi. Hey. How are you today? I am doing fantastic. I have been really eager to uh, do this sort of interview. I've never had somebody want to do the, the reverse side interviewing me for my own podcast. So this is um, this was a treat, definitely, Howard. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm, I'm glad that we're doing this. Mm -hmm. That um, uh, maybe, maybe you want to tell everybody why we're doing this and how this happened. Yeah, yeah, because I interviewed you. Um, wow, now what, what episode was it? So oh, it was pretty early. Yeah, yeah. early on, probably. Like six or, yeah, something like that, seventh yeah, or eighth. Yeah eighth, I think. And um, I wanted to get to know more about you and uh, micro remediators. And then you kind of came back and wanted to help me out with interviewing me for my own podcast. You figured that some of the listeners would want to know more about me and the host of Flora Funga podcast. And I at first was like, oh, do people really care about that? And then kind of thought about it more. And I was like, yeah, usually the podcast that I enjoy most is when I get to know the people that I'm listening to and kind of know their personal life. So this is kind of a, a spiel on that. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, like when you introduce each one of your podcasts, uh, you say <laughs> a passion for fungi mm -hmm. <laughs> and people who, uh, who are interested in fungi we're all here for our own reasons mm -hmm. and some of those reasons are really really broad and i was very curious uh, about where your interest started out um, and it, it became pretty obvious early on <laughs> that um, you you're a, a very broad thinking person mm -hmm. uh, technically and that you've had a, a long history of uh, interest in fungi so why don't you talk a little bit about that and and maybe about um uh what was the first time that you you got interested in mushrooms for yeah instance? yeah so kind of the first picture that i've pulled up for my powerpoint thing here um i was driving a golf cart on my grandparents land and i came across this amanita of some sort um, now looking back and I was like whoa what is this magical thing like it it was just like so big I guess you can see the reference to myself and so I'm just kind of laying on the grass took a photo of myself and I just wanted to learn more about it I I knew mushrooms were a thing just because I am very interested in plants so um, going to college, I definitely knew, you know, plant biology and plant physiology was my big um, thing that I wanted to look into. And then when I saw this mushroom, I was like, whoa, what is that? I want to learn more. Uh, my mom actually got me the mycelium running book for my birthday. <laughs> and going all the way back to like my childhood, every time my parents would give me a book, I would kiss I would kiss the book for some reason, just because I loved it. And um, I was even bribed as a young kid with like workbooks <laughs> and like, like, oh yeah, if you uh, want to do this uh, thing, you have to, uh, we'll just get you a workbook. And I was like, all right, I'm in. So I loved learning at a younger age, um, always was read to us at a younger age. So I just really loved books. I dove deep into mycelium running and um, posted, noted all of the stuff up and just kind of learn the interactions between plants and fungi. So that was like, oh, wow, I can pertain this to my plant biology class. And every time we had some sort of presentation in plant physiology, wetlands, um, plant biology, I had a soils class where I pertained my presentation to fungi. Um, so I was that crazy mushroom person in my class. And it was something different. My professors never really knew much about mushrooms. So that was kind of a plus because then they couldn't really dock me points as much because they didn't know as much as me. So that was kind of funny. Um, <laughs> and, but yeah, I loved just educating people on uh, mushrooms, fungi, the interactions between plants and that. Um, so yeah, that even went into when I 
went to New Zealand for a month and did a fun class with that as well. So um, I have some pictures later that I can show of that and um, dig into that later too. But. So it's a passion for books as mm. much as a passion for fungi. Yeah, passion for learning, educating. Yeah. yeah. And I never really knew it until I started this podcast, I think. Yeah, yeah. So what made you start the podcast? That yeah. it's, it's fascinating because I know you're an extremely busy person. You have yeah. a job. Yes. And um, you are, you're busy uh, uh, every day of the week doing something. I noticed that uh, this weekend you finally got out and spent a little bit of time alone in the woods. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems like you're usually uh, working. And I know podcasts are, are something that require a lot of effort and it's a big yeah. learning curve doing that. Yeah, so how did definitely. you get into, uh, into the idea of doing the podcast? Yeah. Yeah. I loved, I loved the idea of learning. And of course, during COVID, I was like, wow, it's winter time. I kind of want something to keep me busy because I don't want to be like everybody else watching YouTube or being watching TV of some sort. Um, so yeah, I actually tried taking a lot of walks, getting outside, and I started listening to a lot of podcasts. Um, certain ones that actually got me into it was like Bloom and Grow Radio, Mushroom Revival, Welcome to Mushroom Hour, In Defense of Plants. They all kind of talked about the ecology um, of plants and fungi, but again, there was only four-ish, four or five, like, main podcasts that I really enjoy listening to, and none of them uh, went into a lot of physiology, so I was like, you know what, maybe I could make a podcast on that. I, I'm a plant biologist. I can look into some stuff. I can have people on that, you know, are more educated than me or just have more different passions and diversity. Um, so yeah, that's really what sparked my interest was I wanted to be able to learn more. And isn't that like a saying, if write a book about what you want to read about. Um, so that's kind of what I decided to do is make a podcast, what I want to listen to. So um, yeah. I mean, completely arbitrary is another one that just started. Um, they talk about trees and that one's really good. So um, yeah, I was like, shit, I can make one. I like networking, uh, maybe look into future job. Um, I could kind of shadow people on the side. It's kind of like a um, big umbrella where I can learn more and hold all of my knowledge in these podcasts so yeah podcasts are interesting you know mm -hmm. that, that this is this is a new part of our lives and um, um, you know I find myself uh, uh, through the day I'll be wearing a headset and whether I'm mowing the lawn or doing whatever I'm listening to a podcast mm -hmm. and, and you you end up we're we're putting these things in into our minds and uh, and able to e explore areas of interest. Um, I think it's a really great thing mm -hmm. that it uh, in your podcast. One of the things that I've noticed is that you you're really drawing from a um, a broad spectrum of people. It's obvious that you're you're interested in in um, learning what's in every corner mm -hmm. and um so how how do you pick how do you find these people and how do you how do you choose uh, uh um the, the ones that you're going to interview and and how is that received because i know a lot of the people that have been on your interviews like me mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of experience mm -hmm. in, in podcasting and so uh, um this is, uh, it's kind of a new thing we're all involved in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think I started with jotting down topics that I am really interested in and kind of looking into certain people that part partake in those. Um, so like I'm looking into people to interview for LG or, um, stuff like that. Cause that's something different too. 
Um, but then I think listening to more podcasts, I also hear that people are being interviewed there um, or there, or I think of different questions um, and then kind of look into people that way. But yeah, a lot of people either have done a podcast before, which is interesting to me because then I can listen to that podcast and think of my own different questions. Because even if we interview the same people, we have different um, ideas of what we want to talk about. So that's also something like Michael Phillips is very about his apple orchard or about um, fruit farming and stuff like that. But I wanted more of the, the mushroom uh, mycorrhizal side. So that was something where I approached and was like, oh, would you be interested in going down this avenue? So um, it, is, it is nice when people already do have they're already on podcasts, but also um, somebody else definitely felt that they didn't have enough knowledge um, just because they might not be a doctor or stuff like that. But I, I want to, like you said, broaden um, my topics. So I have like some, I just interviewed somebody yesterday on like immunology and acupuncture and how she pairs Chinese herbs with that. Um, so that, that was just really interesting, um, totally different side. And it might go over a lot of people's heads with all of the neurology talk. Um, but I think somebody else is out there and they're like, oh, finally, somebody's doing this kind of aspect. So yeah, just kind of gathering different ideas and something that will pertain somewhere with plants or fungi um, is kind of my main idea. Does any of this relate to the work that you're doing now uh, for a living? Yeah, I actually, there is, um, at Mayo, they actually have their own podcast and she is uh, Bobby Pritt, I believe, and she has her own that's about like parasites and virology. And then they also have one, obviously, just based around COVID. And I actually approached them, too. And I was like, hey, would you guys do like a trailer swap? Because we're both at Mayo and that'd be kind of fun. Um, we do in our lab have some sort of candida. We test for candida and like tetanus and stuff. And candida would be a fungus. Um, so that would be interesting for like my um, director to come on and kind of talk about that with the digestion system and like how that pertains to humans. Um, and that would be really interesting. Um, so yeah, I would like to get more sciencey too. Um, but yeah, again, my, my main passion is like outside <laughs> plants and fungi, but that would be something different too. Yeah, it's so interesting that that oftentimes when we're sitting inside learning about something, it really is is drawing us back outside. Mm -hmm. and I know it's been that way in my own life. And in, in fact, in, in college, I can remember uh, one of my professors uh, in microbiology was trying to get me interested in in cellular slime molds mm -hmm. and life cycling them on uh, on on. Uh, Escherichia coli bacteria. And I was thinking, why would anybody want to learn about a slime mold? And, <laughs> and, and yet, when you finally have those windows opened in the out of doors and mm -hmm. see the beauty that you can see and, and learn what you do, it gives you, it informs you differently about, about what you're doing inside and that mm -hmm. relationship. And so I'm thinking about what you said about your professors in college that um, you're learning plant physiology and they don't really know about mushrooms. Yeah, and then you yeah. talk about, about um, use the word mycorrhizal. And now this is something that I noticed that uh, uh, on every street corner, somebody is saying the word mycorrhizal. <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's the hot topic. Yeah. Now. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that, that, what what I see you doing here is that you're giving some meaning to those words and real examples mm. through the people that you're bringing in and interviewing and the way that you're asking your questions and talking about yourself. Thank you. That means a yeah. lot. Yeah. Yeah. So in your in your work again at Mayo Clinic, 
Mm -hmm. um, specifically, um, what are you working on? Uh, we are analyzing blood samples. So we kind of get in, yeah, patient samples and I work different types of benches depending on the day. Um, some is blood, some is serum. And we are testing for antibodies um, or like the immunology. Um, we're testing their like immune system before or after taking a medication to make sure that some of their cells are um, depleted so then they can go on with treatment or we're also looking at babies um, immunity as well. So mostly analyzing blood samples, um, sometimes serum, but then yeah, we send out those results and kind of let them know if everything's okay or if they have to keep going with medication or stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of, um, our lab's very manual. I know a lot of labs at Mayo is um, automatic, but I like the manualness. It gives me, you know, something to <laughs> feel more accomplished with. And, um, but yeah, again, I am inside all day. It's, it's a little too much, but. Yeah. So do you find your, yourself as you're doing this, uh, uh, reviewing some of these experiences. You mentioned one a while ago about going to New Zealand. What did you do there? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let me see if I can go through some of these things here. Um, so uh, when I was in, I, what year did I wow. get? 2015, I think is when I was there. But yeah, I, I wanted to go for a month. Uh, it was like two weeks volunteer uh, rehabilitation, restoration, and then two weeks, we kind of like adventured from the South to the North Island and kind of getting to know the culture. And again, me just looking at plants and fungi. So I took so many pictures. Um, but yeah, this is the first day we got there. And I was like, holy crap, look at this plant. It's so big. I don't feel like we have any like green things here that are just so like Jurassic or stuff like that it it blew me away and of course day one people are already knew that I was the crazy plant mushroom person because every time I was like oh you guys gotta look at this you gotta uh, take pictures of me with this so um but yeah we stayed on an island um without um like any trash like it was one of those leave no trace type of islands I think we had like a Wi-Fi router just in case, but there was two people living on this whole uh, Moto Motoe uh, Island in New Zealand. And we, we would wake up and go out and hike the bush, um, collecting seeds. We planted a lot of um, native plants in the wetlands. We would also um cut down like invasive vines um i also uh we we had to do well i think i was the only one that had to do um like a credit i wanted to receive a credit for studying abroad so that entailed teaching a class on something anything really and i picked the importance of fungi obviously and i brought my mycelium running book and um, since I had all of those post-its in there, I kind of just made like a cool little um, workshop where we collected, I think you can maybe see something at the bottom of the page or the picture on the left. We collected some like moss and some fungi and we're just kind of like learning to identify like what different mushrooms look like and where you can find them. And so I was teaching a class on the importance of fungi. Um, so thank you to Paul Stamets for that awesome book and everybody just kind of fell in love with me falling in love with mushrooms. Um, I think everybody really enjoyed it just because of how passionate I was. And that's, I think, when I really learned that I could um, kind of mold and help people understand a different side of nature. Um, yeah, so this is me um, and one of the local helper volunteers, um, and we are cutting down an invasive um, species where they have like a huge seed pod. I'd actually have to look um, up what the plant was again, but they had like seed pods and once they um, 
open, then like millions of seeds would just fly everywhere. So we were trying to cut down all of them and um, kind of get rid of them. So it was a really fun experience. I would definitely go back. And so this is me just like enjoying the coast of it. Yeah, it could be anywhere you look at that. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, did you find that the people in New Zealand have more receptivity when you talk about fungi? Oh, yes. Um, I, I feel like even uh, like there were 70 year olds with tattoos. It was everybody was just so open minded, so nice. Um, everybody just really cared about the environment. But again, you are on an island. So it's kind of like you only have a limited space to have trash on, to farm. So I think they're very um, open to environmental purposes and that you, you would see that everywhere, um, like composting signs and stuff like that. So, and they actually really- that, that our, our governments, the, uh, the uh, government in New Zealand and the United States, we've had a lot of interchange over the years mm -hmm. through forestry. And so, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with the, uh, the habitat down there because there are some, uh, at least from the standpoint of weather, we share some similarities. And so, you know, I recall in my early days working in the national park system, hosting, uh, visiting, visiting groups of foresters from New mm -hmm. Zealand. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has become uh, really, um, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to say paramount in, uh, uh, in our um, uh, forest production is that we incorporate fungi into mm -hmm. the growth of young seedlings. Yep. And so, yep. um, you know, this is something that ha had been developing um, really for decades. And uh, I find that over here, it's people that are within that industry that understand that. But I, I mm -hmm. think I'd agree with you that, that, that I know that the groups that certainly the people that we met over the years uh, from New Zealand seem to have a broader and closer connection um, yeah. to to all aspects of nature. Yeah, no, I, I also think that plays a part with uh, like the native um, peoples that are there, the, the Maori culture. Um, they're very respected and they have uh, a lot of their language everywhere still and they're very in tune with nature and the connection of um, everything. So I think that also plays a role where people respect that because the main um, um, cultures respect plants and fungi and nature and water, all of the elements. Um, so I think maybe that also is something that's definitely different in the US, so. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. It is. I think I think that we're uh, um, we are starting to recognize those connections that make us feel that way, mm -hmm. and that uh, our disciplines are growing together now. And so, um, like what you're doing, this podcast is is something that is. Uh, uh, diversity uh, of people interested in different subjects, yet all linked mm -hmm. yeah. um, through the flora and fungi and funga. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I also have somebody that will be coming on just because they like the um, look of plants and fungi. She um, takes a lot of photography of lichen. And I, even if you're not like a main scientist and you just like to have um, cool plant or fungi photos. I like to talk about that too. Like the art of um, nature is something that a lot of people can relate on. So, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Either mm -hmm. looking at it from the the way zoomed out view or the way zoomed in. <laughs> you saw that big plant that the, yes. the plant with those huge leaves. Yeah, and. and um, uh, so what was the first plant in your life that uh, 
yeah. got you interested in in all of this stuff that took you to New Zealand and here today? Yeah, definitely. I I wish I actually had a photo, but growing up in um, Milwaukee, my parents had this huge red maple tree, and I just would. I don't know what it was. I was just fascinated by it. I think it was just so big and I could climb it. So I decided, um, yeah, like anytime I was in a bad mood or I just wanted to think stuff over or I wanted to journal, I would uh, climb this red maple and just kind of hang out up there. It's kind of like a mutual uh, relationship. I think I gave it some, you know, life and it gave me some back. So I think that's the first real like connection that I had with a plant. And that was, yeah, definitely, I guess, whenever I could climb a tree, I don't know how old that was, but um, yeah, I wish I had a, a picture of that. I also had a neighbor that always grew tulips and uh, my mom told me the story that I would go over there and just like pluck or flick all of the tulips because I just thought they were so pretty and it just like was pretty falling <laughs> and she made me go back and apologize that I picked all of their plants um, but no they were like oh no it's it's fine it's fine so um, definitely one of my first memories um, dealing with that is yeah me flicking people's tulips <laughs> along the whole block <laughs> and uh having to apologize I just thought it looked so pretty I don't know what was the big deal but yeah that was fun climbing trees is still definitely something I like to do every time I go apple picking um there's even yeah this one um me this was like a tradition that we always had was um every fall we'd go apple picking and there was always trees that I could climb and so I always got the bucket up there and I would pick you know the most pristine apples and hang down like a monkey from them and um just had fun so I still do that to this day I think last fall I went three times just because I love picking apples <laughs> Well, I tell you what, you know, that uh, climbing trees is fun and I, yeah. I still climb trees whenever I can too, and usually when nobody's looking. Um, and, um, you know, it's a big part of forestry that, uh, that people that climb and uh, harvest seeds, for instance, mm -hmm. for Douglas mm -hmm. fir. And uh, that's, that is a, a, an interesting career and there are people that do that. Yeah. And we have our, our forests, like I'm thinking right now about the H.J. Andrews Experimental Forest down in Oregon. Mm -hmm. This is a place that you need to come to someday if you like climbing trees. And maybe you can talk them into uh, uh, letting you go up and look at some of that overstory mm -hmm. yes. uh, research that they're doing on, uh, on the everything that lives in them up high. Ooh, that sounds really fun. Yeah, no, forestry sounds really really interesting to me oh yeah it's it's a whole nother world mm -hmm. another perspective uh, with every foot that you ascend above ground um, that you're not in an airplane or on the side of a mountain uh, these trees uh, the canopies are are just amazing yeah wow yeah. beautiful so do you do you think um do you feel like you are on um, some type of a path right now that all of this stuff that you're doing is guiding you <laughs> into uh, uh, a place in the future that's either, is it a place or is it mm. a career or, or is it just more of the same? Are you going to keep doing more of the same? Oh, no, I, I definitely like to switch it up. Um, I feel like I am hanging out in limbo right now. Mm -hmm. I am gathering more knowledge and talking to more people, kind of learning where to go next. Um, next to me is moving to Arizona, where I want to get my master's in plant physiology and conservation. Um, ASU Tempe has a uh, some sort of program like that. So that's hopefully my next move in uh, December, whenever 
Um, hopefully I can get some sort of job down there. Um, I could transfer with Mayo. They have um, two Mayo clinics there, one in Phoenix and one in Scottsdale. So I'm kind of looking into, I know they're starting a collab program between ASU and the new um, Mayo in Scottsdale. So that'd be really nice to do some sort of research with them. And then next fall I can start um, at ASU. So hopefully that kind of works out. We'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, I think more of my dream job would be something that deals with me collecting data, like raw data out in a forest somewhere. I love working by myself. Um, I love just like protecting nature. Um, so like either, yeah, collecting something for um, analyzing to br be brought back into a lab later that day or um, like a park ranger of some sort. I feel like that's like a retirement thing, like in New Zealand where I can just walk around and enjoy nature, but I definitely want to do more research, um, based things first, um, dealing with of course, like plant and fungi interactions. So, um, yeah, I don't know really where that would be or what that job title really is, but that's, um, that's my next real move is getting more um, field work experience, definitely. You were just in Arizona, weren't you? Yeah, I visited um, just to kind of see if I liked the environment. Um, I, of course, I was there at the perfect time, like mid-April, so everything was in mm -hmm. bloom and it was gorgeous yeah. and um, yeah, I tried going to around ASU, but right now it's all under construction. So it was really hard to like walk around down there, but, um, honestly, it was a really fun environment. My friend actually just moved down there too. So, um, I actually have a few friends that live down there. Um, and that'd be just like an easy ish transition. Um, but anywhere on like the West coast, I think is where my next ideal spot would be like Washington or like Oregon, Northern California, something like that is like where plants and fungi are just perfect, especially lichen and moss and the moss there is crazy. <laughs> it really is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's, mm -hmm. and it's so diverse. You yeah. know, here on the Olympic Peninsula, we have everything from a desert environment with cacti to mm -hmm. uh, to the rainforest and big, big timber. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that that people who uh, people who go into um, plant pathology mm -hmm. and 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 particularly mycologists that uh, and not that many years ago, if you were a mycologist, chances are you were probably working in a lab. And you were probably working with uh, uh, fungi that mm -hmm. is used for pharmaceuticals. And now um, there's so much more interest in um, fungi that make mushrooms. Yeah. And um, it's, I think, a probably a really good time for you to be uh, to be involved in that now. And you're Perfect. you're uh, for the really really I think that for the first time. Um, uh, you can make a, a transition between what you're doing in a blood lab right now. Mm -hmm. uh, now the the uh, that we're recognizing these uh, relationships, mycorrhizal relationships, particularly uh, the chemistry of of, uh, of uh, the metabolism of uh, plants and fungi mm -hmm. and microbes and how they interact. That. Um, you'll be able to bring those um, skills and perhaps some yeah. of the, uh, the testing uh, equipment that you're using into the big outdoors. Yeah, yeah, I know um, a lot of places like flow cit cytometry. So that's um, something that we really use in our lab is like counting cells and stuff like that. And I think a lot of labs or people are looking with people with experience in that so 
no, that is really interesting. There's even stuff you can just like bring into the lab or into like the field now, just like small like PCRs and like stuff like that. So that's really interesting how small and um, cool it's getting out just even in the field, you can test something right there. It's crazy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the field of transcriptomics, all of the omics okay. that we have, that we have uh, uh, access to now that can be applied to any, uh, any, uh, uh, any part of life to mm -hmm. look at it is, is something, like you say, that you can put it in your pocket now yeah. and, and people are, are able to carry um, equipment that will give uh, DNA uh, uh, readouts mm -hmm. uh, as amateurs and be yeah. able to afford that as, as a hobby. And, yeah. and so mm -hmm. the, the information that we share now with each other is something that uh, is really um, accelerating the, um, the breadth of scientific knowledge in, in all of our disciplines. Very true. Yeah. 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 It's crazy how like citizen scientists are now, um, especially in mycology, I think is like a, a big thing is you don't have to go to school to do certain things. You can just have passions about it and get into it on your own. So. Yeah, that is that that is certainly the path that, that I took and, mm -hmm. and many very, very famous mycologists uh, that yeah. are alive now. Um, they came to this through their passion for fungi too. Mm -hmm. And, and it was that passion that informed them and not necessarily, um, uh, at a university, um, but certainly the work that is coming out of our universities now in this field is really, really amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More and more, uh, places are having certain things. So. That's yeah, very I helpful. Can, I can see you maybe coming to Corvallis. I think you need yeah. to put that on, on your uh, bucket list of places yep. to visit when you come out here. That is where, because um, I have a friend that lives in Portland. So when I was there, um, right after I came back from New Zealand, I was like, oh, I want to go to Corvallis so, for like my master's. So I was looking into that. I visited. Um, so yeah, I honestly, I'm very open to a lot of different areas. Um, I know transferring with Mayo would probably be the easiest, most safest, but I'm also not down for the safest. I can, I can go anywhere, <laughs> but yeah, no, I definitely like that area and, um, was looking at my master's there as well. That was great. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're, uh, that uh, little girl that is standing there um, with those deer right now, um, did she have an inkling of where this was all going to go? And if you could talk to her, uh, um, would you tell her anything about uh, um, where all of this could be leading or give her any advice? Yeah, no, I... I know I I love that my mom sent me some of these photos. Um, I don't remember this at all. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, and I just realized that we have the same haircut right now. So that's also uh, funny. But yeah, no, I growing up, I really loved animals. I think that's what started everything is I really wanted to be a vet. Um, like every other little girl's dream. And I went into that, look, looking into that, and I don't know what it was. I think I'm allergic to, um, like, shedding cats and dogs. Um, so I was like, oh, maybe a vet's not, like, the best thing, and then I'd have to put down a lot of animals. Um, but with plants, you don't, I mean, they don't really, like, talk back, but they do. Um, so it's, it's something different that you don't feel bad about, like, testing um, and yeah, I never knew that I would get into the plant realm, but now looking back, looking at all of these photos that um, I've been digging up, um, like even like this one, I love gardening. My grandparents always had a garden and they always asked me to help with stuff. Um, also, if my grandma would hurt herself, I was the one to like put the bandaid on because I wasn't afraid of blood. I would love 
the weird stuff like playing in mud and um, getting dirty and all of that. But yeah, advice for myself, I think I would just say keep up with being diverse and um, just try to like get in different avenues of the plants or fungi or animals, any other like nature stuff. Um, and definitely to get into public speaking more. I think that's also why I started this podcast, um, to help with public speaking and articulating my words better. Um, so that's something that I, I know nobody ever wants to do as like a middle schooler is stand up in front of the class and like read your story. Um, so I never wanted to do that. But yeah, that's something that I would say for any younger kid is to get more into public speaking um, because it will just help you in the long run, not even in front of people, but to like your family or friends or, um, you know, a toast at your sister's wedding or something like that. So, um, but yeah, definitely always had some sort of nature animal um, upbringing. So so is it mostly vegetables or, uh, or do you like flowers too? Um, I, yeah, I guess this photo also shows that I'm mostly a green plant person. I think flowers yeah. are, everybody likes flowers because they're pretty, but I like, like, I guess all the stuff in behind me or in my house, I have probably a couple orchids, um, but that's really it. This like for flowering stuff at the moment. So that is something interesting, like the cool, like, like things like this is just like cool to me. It's just green. And how does it just keep going? It just does. It just has its own way. Um, and it's pretty to me. I like the color green. It's very vibrant, I think. So it draws me in. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, of all, all the colors, I, I find it really interesting, uh, in that, um, um, it, it is the symbol of life, mm -hmm. certainly for us Westerners, yeah. where it is so green, <laughs> it's yes. really green. Winter is so sad, and then all of a sudden, it's like a whole yeah. restart of the season, and you're like, whoa, yeah. leaves on trees, oh, it's the little things. Yeah, we don't turn brown around here mm -hmm. in the winter, really, a little bit, but, uh, you know, there's, there's so many evergreens, so there's a lot of facts to know about this. So what are your favorite uh, facts that you know about, about plants and fungi? Yeah, yeah my, uh, my go-to party um, fact would be um, asking people if they know or they're familiar with the smell of fresh cut grass. And of course, everybody's like, oh my gosh, I love it. It smells so good. It's so fresh, so clean. And then you tell them that it's really the plant screaming for help. <laughs> and then we were like, oh my gosh, what? Um, so that's something that I, I love to share with people is that, yeah, the plants are, uh, they think they're being attacked or there's some a burver, um, like animals eating it or stuff like that. So they're like spreading off the VOCs. Um, to signal that something is attacking them and they have to let the next blade know that. So um, that's really interesting. Wow. Yeah, so. Wow, who would have thunk? I know, right? The communication yeah. is, uh, is crazy between plants and it's uh -huh. something very little known, but, um, and then I guess- Well, they might scream, but, the, but after the screaming, what do they do? <laughs> Can they help each other? Um, yeah, yeah, they, um, some species can help with, um, like, bringing certain, um, what would you say, like, bad tasting things up through their uh, shoots and in their leaves, like a, a silic acid or, um, forget what the acid name is, but huh. Huh. Um, they can make certain leaves taste bad for other um animals that are eating on their leaves or even signal to the predator to attack the insect that's attacking the plant. So it's, there's a lot of like mimicry happening or a lot of signaling to um, bring other animals to attack that 
insect, which is crazy. Everything's kind of working together or just mimicking certain things to get their way, which is really cool. Yeah, I've heard some uh, mycologists say that they feel that the primary life relationship is pathogenic. Mm. Do you think that's true? Pathogenic. That it's competition and not uh, and and not cooperation. Um, I feel like depending on the the minerals or nutrients, maybe. I feel like some definitely have more of the mindset or whatever you would want to call it um, to it be more of the parasite and want to just take. Um, but I think a lot of things want to help the host survive so that they can survive. But is that also being a parasite? Ooh, that's, that's the trick question. Um, it really is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that it's like, do they know it's for just them or do they know that it will help, you know, both of us? So then we both, um, yeah, grow together, which is interesting. I feel like it's a good combo, depending on how they feel. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. You know, I think things have certainly worked themselves out in a beautiful way as we look around ourselves and look out the window mm -hmm. um there's a lot more going on than what meets the eye definitely yeah seeing yeah. is not always believing <laughs> <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so um after these how many how many podcasts have you done so far now it's been um i think i'm on 16 um, yeah. I, I know that I've, um, this month I've been doing back to back. Um, yeah. So my weekends going, going back to that first question of how busy I am, I definitely go to work. Um, but I work four tens. So that worked out perfectly for when I started my podcast, I had three mm -hmm. days off. So usually Sundays are my like catch up my own type of uh, hanging out with family or friends, being outside. And then Mondays and Tuesdays, I try to have um, one or two interviews. Um, so yeah, like yesterday I recorded something and we are recording today, which is a Tuesday. Um, and I kind of stack up a lot of these um, every Tuesday or Monday. And then usually I have like a month off break where I already have like everything recorded. I just have to um, edit or release the podcast. So that's been pretty nice to have like months off, but nobody knows, you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I think that's been very helpful is um, contacting a lot of people, stacking some things up and then having enough to kind of um, carry me on because I will be going to Germany in August. So I'm taking like a month and a half off from Germany to my birthday. So that'll be, um, but was there a rude question that you asked me? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I was, I was trying to lead in the direction of, uh, uh, there's been, what, 16 podcasts, I think. Yes, just said. yes, that's where we're at. Um, and that there's, um, you know, I, I see connections certainly between them all. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you see uh, um, a mosaic or a pattern forming mm -hmm. here. And if you, if you could say something to everybody that's listening um, about where you would like to see this go and, mm. and that um, are there gaps? Are there big questions that have come up? that have only come up because of the breadth of uh, all of the, the, the diverse people that you've interviewed so far? Do you feel like, um, like um, a, a picture is starting to emerge that has gaps in it that you would like to fill in a certain way? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, my thing, my interviews are definitely starting to get 
I know a lot of um, herbalists and people are approaching me on Instagram, which is awesome. Um, so that's something that's a totally different realm um, where it's just more nature and the love of that. Um, less science, but I'm okay with that because on this side, I got um, like the research with you. I've got um, so many other different avenues that are more science-based and might go over people's heads. Um, so I'm trying to, yeah, like balance out uh, getting down and nerdy, but then like also loving nature. Um, so, so the gap is um, maybe something in between that. I've been doing a lot of plant things as well. So hopefully um, kind of look more into the fungi side more or um, even getting into like cooking with mushrooms or um, yeah, what else? I think uh, I wanna touch on cannabis and like the connections with cannabis and fungi and how um, that's like a interconnected thing and with mold and, um, the, the little underrated topics I think is more of what I want to cover on. Um, but yeah, no, that is interesting. Like trying to put it on like a, a mosaic as you would, but hmm, yeah, I'll have to like, think about that more, I'm trying to close yeah. more of those, um, those gaps, but I'm, I'm trying to get all of my fingers out, I think, in different like avenues, and then maybe closing it in more as I go along. Yeah, I noticed that, you know, like you, you mentioned the uh, emerging cannabis industry, mm -hmm. that um, um, just how important fungi is to that. Yeah. And that, um, um, you know, a lot of people have really, uh, invested a lot in in um, uh, building the infrastructure to grow and um, watch it all go down the tube because of mold mm -hmm. or, or outdoors outdoors too because of pushing those environmental um, um, defining lines about uh, of, of where in uh, and uh, oh, I think that if we look at the growth zones, for instance, uh, when you're looking in your seed catalog, mm -hmm. that that um, these things are are forcing a development of this particular agriculture that is so susceptible to molds and fungi. Yes. Um, uh, that what we're learning right now is coming at, at great cost to those people who are um, experimenting in this new industry. Yeah, agriculture would be really interesting to look into with uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, plants, uh, learning more about seeds I would love to do like algae, um, also different types of peoples I would love to interview, uh, like either around the world um, or just like different cultures and how um, they think about nature. Like I'm having somebody on from, um, I think they live in Oregon actually. Um, and she does some like botanical um, products. So that's gonna be really fun to interview her on and um, how she takes um, medicinal plants and um, medicine and turns it into products, so. Yeah, it's fascinating. And, mm -hmm. and it's fascinating that, that with one plant, you have many, many different uses. And yes, people, definitely. especially when you talk about um, uh, the uh, uh, cultural uses, traditional cultural uses mm -hmm. of plants, that they're not always for the same thing. Right. That, that they might be uh, used in uh, completely different ways, uh, medically, medicinally. Mm -hmm. It's it is fascinating, yeah. and 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 there is a thread of connection there, I believe, in, in most of the time. But it's not really easy to see um, completely. I'm I'm surprised as as I. Uh, learn about the different um, cultural uses of, of plants. Mm -hmm. One plant 
for so many things. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Some things are sacred to some people and other, um, they don't even know what it is. And it is, it is very, very different and um, vast understandings, which is interesting in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like we've, we've covered things pretty good here. Is yeah. there uh, any direction uh, in, in our conversation here? that you would like to go and uh, anything yeah. that you think uh, we should be talking about? Yeah, I want to just touch on um, some research that I did, which was really fun. Um, let me find these. So here's more of, oh, and growing up, I loved fishing. So this is, my mom just sent me this photo of me just like ah. fishing for fun um, or like some other handouts that I was doing growing up like one says I love the smell of fresh air <laughs> or like I love to feel flowers um so yeah it just just explains how nerdy I was growing up um and then um let's see yeah so um I did um like an undergrad research conference uh the URC at Mankato and this all started because I, of course, was in, I think, a certain, a certain plant or fungi, fungus class with a friend, and she knew how much I loved the interactions between those two, and she said, oh, I'm in the middle of doing some research. Erin um, Mosman actually did part of the beginning methodology of this, so she went, and um, in Casota, I believe, is where the the research was done um, and she was looking at the impacts of UV, UVB radiation um, on standing versus fallen cattail species and kind of um, learning the microbial communities with that. And so she thought, oh, Caitlin would love to do uh, probably the lab part of this and then do the result um, part of it as well. So. I partaked in this, um, this research, um, and this was one of the professors that I was dealing with. Uh, this is Timothy Seacott. And then the other one was Christopher Rulin, which I had on the podcast for photosynthesis. So um, us four kind of like took different avenues. Um, I did a lot of the lab type stuff. You can see, um, let's see, I'll go to the main thing. So this is the poster that I had and in methodolo methodology, um, that is me <laughs> in, in a hood. Um, and we are taking plant material, which is the Typha augustifolia, the cattail species. And um, I'm pretty much putting um, a solution of some sort into biologues and analyzing them to count these species and to kind of create uh, ordination um, to understand what we're looking at. So we had some fallen cattail species and then we had some standing ca cattail um, litter bags is kind of what she put out there. Um, and then some were reduced um, UVB radiation and some were just ambient UVB radiation. And we were hypothesizing that um, the fallen versus standing cattails would have different microbial communities. Um, also, we figured that, you know, the stuff on the ground would be closer to soil. So hopefully it would have their own microbial community and maybe different types. Um, so um, me analyzing them and then making this ordination, we actually did suggest that they had a, a difference with fallen and standing. So that was really cool to be a part of this. And this was a huge challenge for me. Again, like public speaking, I had to make this poster. I think this took, you know, like a year of doing the in-lab stuff and then a couple, like six months after to just do the poster. So this was fun having Aaron as a mentor and then working with my professors on uh, research that I actually was really interested in um, with plants and fungi. So um, 
we, yeah, we kind of found some significant difference and uh, I know we could have went more further with this. And I think, I hope, I hope that whoever took this on in the next years, um, they kind of wanted to look at the different microbial communities and their uh, structure and function with the plant. So it was just kind of cool that I got to be a part of undergrad research. Um, and now I'm really eager to do more of that um, in the future. So that was really fun. And actually, I think this one, yeah, um, I, I just wanted to do uh, a little extra microscopy stuff. So I had the leftover plant material and I showed this to Seacott and he was like, oh, I think those are um, like half hyphae um, where those arrows are. And so mm -hmm. that was just kind of cool that I just, I just picked a piece and I was just like, oh, this looks really cool. And then he's like, yeah, I think he found something. So that was just kind of cool. Um, and I wanted to include that in this uh, presentation. So yeah, I uh, got Were into technology able... and- Oh, excuse me, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying that um, I was not that good with technology and learning how to make graphs. Um, dealing with instruments, um, all this microscopy stuff, all of this was like new, um, new techniques to me, and I, re I really like it. So it was fun. So during that study, um, were you restricted to uh, following a process that was inflexible? Or did you encounter things where your contributions and um, and like you found something there? Mm -hmm. um, did that impact the study? And did that uh, uh, for you? Did you feel as though you were you were um, sort of a pioneer? I guess would mm -hmm. be a good a good way of thinking about it. So you're you're in new territory when, yeah. whenever anybody is doing a a research project it it really is a form of a, a pioneering endeavor hopefully you know mm -hmm. we're not wanting to reinvent the wheel or <laughs> or rerun uh, old old experiments and and such so how did that work out for you yeah and yeah and i know that um because i I was taking on this research halfway through. So like I said, Erin was, uh, she did the real like out in Casota Prairie um, and also kind of ground down the plant material. And then she, she handed it off and kind of, she already had some sort of written out um, procedure that she wanted me to make sure that I followed because um, I was very new with this and I don't know if I knew, like, you know, when you're, you're starting out and you're like, I don't even know what I don't know. And I think it was kind of like that where I, everything was new to me and I was like super down to just um, get in sync with my own ways. So it was really fun going into the lab, like doing all of this by myself, but I was taught the procedure um, before this and kind of what to look for. Um, so if yeah, anything went weird, I would just meet up with my professors and we would talk about um, certain things. And I think the only time where I was, yeah, really like confused was the ordinations are making those like DCA type of graphs. Um, Cause I was like, oh wait, am I looking at like, what are these axes? Cause like they're not labeled and they're just environmental gradients. So it's just like learning what you don't know and what to ask, I think is the hardest thing. But finding this or taking this photo, um, definitely spark their interest on, oh, what can we do for future posters and how can we continue this research? Because we didn't really know what to expect as results as much. Like I knew, we knew that there would be a difference based on fallen and standing. But yeah, there was uh, really interesting trends. So I think that sparked their interest of continuing it, um, looking deeper in those different microbial communities and yeah, kind of using that as like their future 
URC posters, poster ideas. Yeah, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I know it, cert it certainly has been in, in my uh, research life too, that uh, oftentimes things pop up that become really, really significant, mm -hmm. either for the project that you're on or yourself. And, and I'm uh, reminded right now of, uh, mm -hmm. of uh, doing uh, research on ectomycorrhizal fungi. Oh, yes. In a dry year, okay, it's yeah. hard to find, right? And uh, and and noticing, uh, or, or actually, our lab man manager noticing the samples that we had um, delivered to the lab. Uh, uh, he couldn't find any uh, mycorrhizas, so he started looking at the dirt <laughs> and finding that the dirt was largely comprised of mycorrhizas. That had dried up and fallen off the rootlets, oh. and so you 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 suddenly, as you're doing these these projects that where you know we're looking for living, robust samples mm -hmm. of uh, ectomycorrhizal tissue to be able to do uh, uh, genetic analysis on, to be able to compare with mushrooms as they fruit, and learn that way. But we find out something that even less is known about. And that will yeah, be wow. the direction of future research for the intrepid explorer that wants to go in this direction someday. Yeah, and that's so really cool. In this work that you're doing, that you've done with the poster, and mm -hmm. and even the work that you're doing in in the uh, with the Mayo Clinic now, it's uh, there. There's always. Um, things moving that are just beyond the field of vision mm -hmm. or in the corner of your vision that are significant yeah. and um, and that that are are directing things and I certainly have noticed like in the trend in your podcast of um, of uh, evolving to include the voices of people that are are making, uh medicinal medications mm -hmm. out of plants and and that going oh shoot i think we've uh, have i lost you here nope oh we had uh, uh another call came in i guess oh. but um the um the cultural aspects of of uh of what the podcast is all about mm -hmm. that it's not just about science it's yeah. also about things that drive people into exploring uh and using their information in new ways and how how that informed them Definitely. how their background informed them yeah now whatever gets you outside or whatever gets you interested um like i think my chat with Addie that I just released, um, she was like, yeah, if it's the bugs, it's the bugs. If it's the fungi, it's the fungi. If it's the clouds, um, if it's the weather, like anything yeah. that actually gets you outside and enjoys it, that's it. Well, I hope you can come out and visit us here yes. when the mushrooms are fruiting. Yes. And uh, uh, see what there is to see outside. Yes, no, I'm, I'm so, I'm so down. I am very excited to venture out west again and um, get my, get my toes dirty again. Yeah, that's great, Caitlin. And, and, and thank you for this podcast. This is yeah. something that when we started talking about, um, about interviewing you that, that um, it, it is interesting. And, and it's, it's this diversity of of who you are that is uh, uh, making the, the uh, palette uh, that you're drawing from for your podcast so interesting mm -hmm. because you're reaching out to such a diversity of people. Uh, yet we're all interested in flora mm -hmm. and fungi. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been very fun. And again, I never knew how much I wanted to educate people or get into this type of topics until I find people passionate about it as well and 
love the soil people. I love the grass people. We're all a little crazy in our own way. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So you have any parting words? Um, I, th I think all I would say is um, for parents that have yeah, younger children, um, don't restrict them if they want to play outside or play in the dirt. Or thank you to my parents that let me climb that tree because I think that made me who I really am. I got to have my own space, my own safe haven. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think that I would be who I am if I was more restricted as um, a child. So again, whatever gets you outside, let them do it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for having this idea. And I hope everybody enjoys um, this episode. It was fun doing it. Okay, Caitlin, we'll see ya. All right, see ya. Happy trails. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>